But let me introduce myself. I am Jay Little. I am a professional tabletop game designer. I am also a professor of video game design and board game production at UW Scout in Menominee, Wisconsin. Uh, I travel across the country to give a number of presentations. Many of them are about game design and production themselves. Uh, I'm also known for some of the work that I've done with Star Wars, so sometimes I'm brought in to talk about what it's like to work with a license. But one of the things that's really, really important to me, both personally and as an instructor, is to talk about accessibility in gaming. This was really driven home to me over the years by being completely ignorant about it, and then slowly but surely learning more and more about it as my pool of friends grew, and I encountered more and more people, either through my social circle or through school, people who had different needs and capabilities that still gain. Um, and I've got some anecdotes to share that I, I hope will be entertaining along the way, but I also want to say that I am blunt if I encounter somebody who has a disability or a special need that I'm not familiar with, because otherwise I don't know how to learn about it. So if I say anything that feels awkward or incorrect, please let me know. But it's only because I am trying to get down to some information. A lot of this information is based on the video game industry because that information is easier to find and easier to track. And secondly, because video games and the need for the controlling schemes also present uh, some similar issues and challenges with accessibility as physical components like dice or cubes or tokens would. And who the traditional gamer is has changed dramatically over the years. Especially since 2000, which isn't all that long ago, as most people would expect, white males, middle-aged. For gaming and a lot of pop culture, they are highly educated or more highly educated than many other hobby centers. Uh, and they've got disposable income. That's one of the necessary things. It's really hard to game. I know there are a lot of college gamers and they're like, disposable income? Well, then their income is disposable time. But they've got something that they need to fill that free time with. I also know a lot of gamers who don't just buy and play one game ever. They've got multiple games. Heck, I've got 200 games in my Steam catalog and I probably haven't touched half. I've got a board game collection of about 2,000 and at least 500 are still in the street rack. We buy more than we can, ever play. Um, but mine isn't disposable. My wife keeps telling me it's not disposable. That's changed a lot. Now, more than half the households in the country have some sort of video game playing in them. In my household, four of us play video games. My mom says she doesn't play video games, but she plays games on her phone. Guess what? She's a video gamer. It used to be that you were only considered a gamer if you were playing a game on a console or on a PC, or you were only considered a board gamer if you were playing certain types of board games. And that's not the case anymore. If you game, you are a gamer. It doesn't matter the platform or the media. Because just like in pop culture, there's a ton of overlap. Also, something that's been refreshing is slowly, the demographic for the gaming community has started to more closely match the demographics for the population of the United States. So the numbers on the left are the uh, video game representation. The numbers on the right, according to the 2012 census, are the percentage of the US population. So, yeah. Are most of your statistics based on the US data only? Yes, because it's difficult to collate all of it as well as get an idea of, it's hard enough to try to uh, deal with and discuss accessibility here let alone other factors. So yes, this is based domestically. Um, <clears throat> so when I was talking about a higher than average disposable income, 16% earning 
100,000 or more is a little bit below, but 35% in that 50 to 100,000 range is a little bit above. So in general, we have money to burn, which is helpful because games keep on getting more and more expensive as well. And because it's a multi-billion dollar industry, apparently we see that it's still worth it. One of the big changes, and something that I am extremely happy about because I need, need, need more women in the video game program, is that women are gamers, and anybody who says that they aren't are just flat out wrong. Not just philosophically, but by the numbers and data. And if people don't take that into account, they are missing out on a huge, huge, important market segment. So just talking about web traffic, people who are going to go online and go to Game Informer, people who are going to go to a website and read an article or review or post on a forum, 41% of all of that web traffic is female. That's a lot. It used to be, I think, in the 20s or lower, but that really sweet segment of the 18 plus, but for video gaming, it's also younger. Uh, you don't need to hit that 18 threshold all the time because those younger gamers have parents buying the games for them, but 18 and older women is more than the 18 and under men in terms of percentage. And that really blew my mind. It didn't seem like that would work out that way. Uh, but it is. And that's in terms of the number who play. However, they also make up almost half of all the purchases. So 46% of all video game purchases. Now, a clarification for this is that male gamers are more likely to buy smaller or individual items that cost more like a core game. Female gamers, and again, this is just on average, tend to buy microtransactions far more frequently. Or app games that have a lower threshold, but they play a wide variety. But when you look at the total number and amount of people who play, it's pretty equal. And so somebody who decides that they don't need to account for the female gaming population is missing out on 46% of the potential market. That is a really good, so, so the expansions are things, the living card games and fantasy flight games does as well. So yeah. things that are either subscription model based yeah. um, or smaller transactions where it's easier to just add it to the rest of your purchase. Yeah. Um, so anyway, a big, big part, of, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's not So some of the questions I'll wait till later so we don't stop on every single slide. Okay. Also, to let you know that I'm talking about accessibility from a number of angles. Unfortunately, there's not ready information or statistics on certain very discrete markets or target areas of what we broadly use as accessibility. So one of the first hurdles to accessibility simply is age. Are they old enough to physically and mentally interact with whatever it is? For board games, that can be sophisticated because can they perform the calculations that they need to, can they physically manipulate the items that they need to to play the game. But kids can start to play video games and other games at a really, really young age. It just takes a certain design philosophy and approach, and you have to know that that's who you're going after to make sure that your game is more accessible. The same thing with literacy. A lot of games, collectible card games are a great example, even more so Pokemon, a game that gets translated, the language is incredibly important, and the language can be dense and difficult. So, literacy can be an issue, especially if English is not their primary language. And a lot of game companies overwrite their rules and overwrite their materials to try to be as exact as possible, but what they're doing is actually making it more difficult for a target segment of their audience to understand and engage with the product. Language skills, so English is a second language, but also 
Um, I guess in here, you could, depending on how you see them or how you would categorize them, I have a cousin who is both deaf and mute, and so those uh, are, are hurdles for him depending on what he's trying to interact with. I don't know how he would prefer to identify those disabilities himself, so you can see that it covers a wide range. And as a video game company, when you're talking about producing a game with millions of dollars of budget, it doesn't take all that much, if you do it in the right way, and you know what questions to ask, to make your game more friendly. So, some of the things that people can do regarding some of these, for example, literacy and language, it amazes me still how many games do not offer captioning or subtitles. Just like it amazes me if I'm watching a movie, if I bought a Blu-ray and it didn't have captions, I would be completely stunner shocked. If you watch streaming media through Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, almost all of those are captioned as well now. So captioning can help with both the reading and the hearing, depending on which one they're more proficient with. Localization. It's really cool to see a game that can be uh, turned into seven or eight different languages or have subtitles in multiple languages. What I really want to challenge myself, I took both uh, French and my degree is in Spanish, would be to listen to the movie in French with Spanish subtitles. I had watched the original Avengers often enough though that I still knew what was going on. But making it an option makes it a lot more accessible where English is not their native language, then let them hear the audio in one, but be able to read in their native language or offer them whatever combination they're more comfortable with. That is expensive, especially when you're talking about a game like Fallout 4, which has hundreds of thousands of lines of voice acting. But some companies realize that video games now are literally international because if it's digitally available, anyone, anywhere, literally can access it. More and more games are providing read aloud instruction. You'll play a lot of games, especially video games, where it will teach you how to play as you play. We don't buy physical books anymore that have the physical rules and the physical layout of what the controller scheme is. While you play, it tells you what buttons to push, or actually it shows you what buttons to push. And sometimes they can do that visually very easy without needing to read it. But one of the biggest things is a graphic language, icons, things that are language independent. So the tap symbol in Magic the Gathering, it is an arrow that rotates 90 degrees to show that you rotate this card. That is internationally understood, and that icon is so signature that it's been trademarked. But that's an icon that it doesn't matter what your national or what your language is, it doesn't really matter what your reading level it is, you can understand that and associate that icon with that action from that point on. The other great thing about it is it is so much cheaper to produce a game that has a clean graphic language because you don't need to translate it. If you can come up with, for example, icons that are really clear and easy to read on dice. I designed the Star Wars roleplay system, which uses colored dice with symbols on them, no numbers, no text, just symbols. And it takes a while, but once people understand and can read that language, they're able to make the calculations much more quickly and able to explain it to other people much more quickly. Uh, this is especially helpful with younger gamers, because younger gamers, it's easier for them to process colors and symbols than it is to calculate numbers and data. So I was going to go through the topics that I had presented and then stop if there are some questions. Uh, but I do want to get through a number of things that I have here so that it covers as broad a range as possible. Inclusivity is definitely a hot topic right now and something that more and more media are aware of. Steven Universe, for example, and Cartoon Network is praised by many people for its openness with its treatment while it does not overtly state the suggestion of LGBT-friendly characters and setting. A lot more video games, for example. Mass Effect, that series is known for offering 
gender irrelevant romantic entanglements, for lack of a better word. Because when you start to talk about aliens, I'm not going to try to start guessing or assuming their sex. But having the options are helpful because it is much easier to engage with and care about a game when you can see someone in there that's like, I can identify with that. Having strong female lead characters. If Wonder Woman has proven anything, a woman can kick ass and rake in millions of dollars. And it's okay to do that. On the PlayStation 4, there's an exclusive game called uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, which is one of the most amazing games I've ever played with a kick-ass female protagonist. <coughs> I have yet to meet anybody who's played it who even brought up the fact that I'm a male who hadn't played female character. Yeah. Nobody. If you make it a strong character and a strong role, people will play it. And the people who don't identify with it will just be ignoring it because it doesn't they don't need to identify it, but the people who do identify with it will <coughs> do something comforting and refreshing for them. I don't like the word disability, but I don't know if there's a better one out there, and I think everybody has their own preferred term based on their capabilities. But 20%, one out of every five gamers, identifies as having some sort of struggle, disability, or accessibility <coughs> issue with, uh, regardless. So 20% of the gaming population then does as well. It's a huge segment. But 92% of the entire disabled community plays games? <coughs> That's amazing. Now we know that there is a, a difference in magnitude of how a disability may impair somebody's access to you. For example, colorblindness. It is much easier for a colorblind person to interact with something than perhaps uh, someone with severe vision impairment than some colorblindness. Regular blindness. I have a story about a video gamer who's 100% born blind that I was fascinated with. Um, The severity though, less than 2%, such a small fraction of people have an accessibility issue that would prevent them from playing a game. That's it. So if that many people are available and that many people <coughs> have some sort of disability, you have to take that into account when designing a game as well because that becomes, just like if you ignore the female population, a significant part of your target market that you're potentially losing out to the companies that are taking the time to make their games accessible. I went to GDC, which is the Game Developer Conference in San Francisco this year, and one of the designers from Turtle Rock Studios, who did the video game Evolve, talked about the huge blunders that they made, that they didn't make their game accessible in any way before launch. So post-launch, they had to put in colorblind modes, they had to put in different language, they basically had to go back upstream and put in all of these corrections, updates, and fixes, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. That if they would have just started out planning with that, they could have put into their workflow and saved hundreds of thousands of dollars. Color blindness is a lot more common than I originally thought. Uh, especially in males, it's very, very rare for women to be colorblind. They need both parents to be colorblind, so it's extremely rare. But 8% of males, I think most people probably know of someone or in a larger community <coughs> or social group, or something with some level of color blindness. So out of all the video gamers, almost 11 million colorblind video gamers. And if you don't have a toggle in your game that converts something to a colorblind friendly palette, you're basically pissing off 11 million gamers who can't tell the difference between your lightly light blue, dark purple, or partial green and red icons. Yeah. Make, a, make a note here. Uh, I just found out that I, my favorite was they have like eight different color lines that I need. Because some of them are like totally ridiculous. So the $22 billion in video game revenues. So 
So out of their public light percentage, that's a large number. But um, I get to that in a little bit. There are a lot more types of color blindness than I thought, other than just red green. So one thing that is easy to overlook is now we have full control over the entire sensory experience. And there's no reason we shouldn't take advantage of that. So it's not just video and visuals, but the sophistication of audio is such that with 3D surround sound audio and headphones, in fact, that's one of the ways that blind gamers navigate a, a gaming area. It is the sophistication of sound allows them to sound out an area like they would if they were walking with their cane. And then touch, oh, rumble feedback in a controller. Or newer controllers that have greater haptic or sensory response and control. That's been a, a great boon to a lot of people, making it easier for them to play. So, to your point about colorblindness, it's basically based on the biology of the cones and rods in your eyes, and literally only seeing two out of the three RGB colors. So most of us are trichromatic, and all of the rods and cones in our eyes work perfectly, and we see the entire spectrum. But for a lot of people, they misinterpret one of the colors in the band of light. So the most common is red-green, but there are three main types of just red-green color blindness, based on the severity and whether they're weaker in red or weaker in green. And so most video games that have a color blind setting treat protonomia, which is the more common type which is the, the most classic red-green. If you've ever been asked to look at the series of circles and dots and do you see a number in here, like the test that we would take in school, it's the most common one for the red-green that they would not be able to discern a pattern. You can find those online. Jeez, that would be weird. Like the hidden image ones where you have to kind of like blur your version, I could never do that. So here's what different games may look like to different gamers. Just that one scene. And in fact, if you have facility with Photoshop, you can easily do the same thing by turning on and off the saturation of different color bands. But you don't necessarily need to know all of this and figure out how to convert it in your own mind. There are apps that make it so easy. At the beginning of every board game I produce, I take out my phone and I pull out my colorblind app and it basically shows me what my components and board looks like for normal vision and the three most common types of color blindness. And I can immediately tell if it's accessible. I only found out that one of my friends is colorblind by playing a game with him that had green and brown cubes in it. Green was food and brown was wood for resources. And we're playing, we're gathering resources and spending them and building, and he's like, hand me a cube, which one? A cube, well, food or wood? What do you mean? There's more than one type of cube? <laughs> He had no idea. I pull out my phone and I look at it and I'm like, oh my goodness, indistinguishable at all. I could not tell either looking through that filter. These are free apps you can download. And it's ridiculous at this point that a video game designer or tabletop designer wouldn't take the 30 seconds it took me to look at and check to see if it's colorblind friendly. A step further, if you think about it ahead of time, you can actually select pre-created colorblind friendly palettes. So there are certain color combinations that you can load into Photoshop or image programs that are already friendly to different types of color blindness. So if you take your normal mode and modify it, you can make sure that the colors that they're converting into follow these, or you can start out with this color palette and then see if you actually need more variance than what that allows. But a 16-bit or a 32-bit game that's gonna look like a classical Nintendo game, there's no reason why you couldn't just do the entire game with a colorblind friendly palette and be done with it. Problem solved. So, one of my favorite encounters ever. Last year I went to Dragon Con in Atlanta, and on my flight back, I sat next to a blind uh, college student. And he heard me mention that I teach video game design. So he's like, oh man, if you played the new Mortal Kombat, that's my favorite game. Okay. Yeah, Call of Duty, we get together. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm dumb. 
I have never met a blind video gamer before. Do you mind if I pick your brain? So he was completely accessible and open with me for two hours on the flight to just figure out how does a blind gamer play video games. And it turns out certain games are so much easier for them to play than others. But a much broader range of games could be accessible with some very simple things. I took his comments and feedback and took it to my students and asked how hard would this be to implement in the game that you're building? Like, well, if we would have known this at the beginning, a day. Because they just need different visual cues. Since they can't use video, you have to think about how many ways can we change, adjust, and present audio and touch. The other sense that they use more than we do, don't, is imagination. We're so used to having things given to us. Once you watch the Game of Thrones TV series, you will never see those characters differently when you read the books. So one of the things I do to try to train my imagination is I listen to old 1940s and 1950s radio dramas. Back when all you had was audio. And those stories are really, really good, but I have no idea what those characters look like. So you end up focusing on different elements. So there's a blind gamer that is competitive with the game Killer Instinct. And this is only from last year. Um, and he was basically writing an article about why he's so good at this game he can't see. And it was fascinating to hear it. You can Google this online and any number of articles would come up. Uh, but there have been some games that were created to see if they could mentally map out a maze based on the feedback that you give them, audio cues, that you've run into something. A rumble when you encounter or pass a threshold. And they're able to fairly accurately recreate a simple maze if you give them the right sensory input. And there have been a number of studies, and then it got really scientific -y on me, and I was easily over my head. But it was fascinating to find out that there was research done into that, because there were enough video game players out there where it made sense to put money into a survey or a research project to learn that. So the big things that blind gamers need to be aware of, and I have some uh, friends that when they play a video game, they need a special machine that magnifies what they're seeing so greatly that for all intents and purposes they sit far enough away from the screen to play a video game that they are blind as well. So it's not just people who are born blind or uh, fully blind. But the things that they really need audio for and you can make sure is baked into your audio for 3D, relative distance. How far am I from my target? How far am I from the end of the ledge, some sort of cue in there that allows them to measure that. A lot of blind people have a clicker that they listen then for the echo that it makes to give them an idea of the relative distance of terrain in front of them. So being able to have some sort of cue like that. But the biggest thing is you know, like, I don't know why you don't create ping <coughs> and chirps. And that would solve 90% of all the problems that blind gamers run into, like pings and chirps, what do you mean? A ping is whenever an event happens that you want to know about, such as a loot drop in Diablo, or a uh, loot crate dropping in Call of Duty. Some ping that tells him this thing occurred. And if you're listening in full 3D sound, you'll know relative to you where it dropped, and you can orient yourself to go pick it up. And I'm like, that sounds pretty reasonable and simple. There's already an audio cue. There's a different audio cue when a legendary item in Diablo 3 drops. So yeah, but if it were better situated 3D wise, I could better navigate to a corner of the map. And then a chirp would basically be when an event occurs that crosses my targeting range. So imagine you're playing a first-person shooter and you have a target reticle where you're aiming. If I could assign a chirp when an enemy went in and assign a different chirp for when a friendly crossed my line of sight, 
that would allow me to better identify who's around me and when to pull the trigger. And just a moment, uh, so many games offer key binding that if you don't like the controls as they are default set, you can remap controls. You can remap what the K button goes. Sometimes you can do that on controllers too. So it's like, why don't you allow us to map three different pings and three different chirps? So I can map a chirp when a friendly crosses, an enemy crosses, and a certain piece of terrain <coughs> if I'm near an edge or something. I can better visually create the scenario I'm in. And I was stunned at the simplicity of those two requests. Because fully sighted people already rely on pings for a lot of things, but we don't care what direction they came in most of the time, because there are other cues that help us. But for them, 3D audio has been a blessing if we would just take advantage of it more often. The chirp one I hadn't considered before, that was brilliant. I thought that was absolutely great to have a certain game event when it passes over the center of your screen, allow you to know, friend, enemy, button to press. Right? If you're doing a puzzle game like uh, Portal or um, Turing or something like that, we have to activate panels on the walls. Whoops. Funny thing is, for the chirps, they already have something that they can just tag it to in a lot of games. Like, how often is it? When your rex goes over an enemy, it turns green. So I was going to say, the reason why these would be so easy to do is they already trigger some response by the program. Red X when you're over an ally. Exactly. And then the, hey, hit the A button. So it's already tied to it. One of the big difficulties in programming is getting the program to stop and be aware of some input the user just gave you. They just pressed the A button. Well, if you have five things that happen when they press the A button, how hard is it to add a sixth? Not that hard. They just need to know early enough in the process because it's a lot easier to do it the first time than have to go back and add it later. But you're absolutely right. And to the point that he was making as well is, when I press the space bar, I'm already jumping. Why can't I also hear this or have some other cue? So what's interesting to the type of game, I was surprised by first person shooter most. He said for side-by-side -side 2D fighters, though, it's great. I know I start on the left. I know what the sound of my attacks make, and the better I get, the more I identify the sound of his attacks and the timing of them. So I can play, maybe not as competitively as some, but I can play because I know information to start with that is guaranteed. I start on the left. And the more I play that character, the better I get. That's great. And then he's like, not enough games offer couch play anymore. Side-by-side -side play, where it's not split screen, but you're actually sharing the screen. The Apple 3 now uses a reference. Two people can play up to four people on the couch, but you're always on the same screen. It never breaks apart as you go off in different directions. He's like, the great thing about that is I've got my buddy right there to fill in the blanks. And they're used to me and understand the cues that I need because we hang out. And so they can give me enough to go, nope, lower left. Or, ah! Spiders are coming. So, so why don't you offer more games that are couch play? Because you already have multiplayer, you already have split screen, you already have all of this stuff in there ready to be used. Why can't you offer this option as well? Now, to this point, this addresses specifically some of the needs that a 100% blind gamer could benefit from. But some fully sighted people could benefit from it as well either just as a reminder, an alert, they have a short attention span, or just because we love to monkey around with customization until we find the perfect combination of sound level to music level to sound effect level to dialogue level. In Fallout 4, I'm gonna adjust the color and opacity of my pit boy versus my, we love to be able to go in and customize the games. And this is just one other way to be able to do it that makes it easier for other people to play. Yeah, a lot of sighted gamers play around with the color blend. I like it when When my uh, kids play Overwatch, my older boy will switch it to colorblind mode so he knows what it's like for one of his friends to play. And it's tough. <laughs> He's like, now we're on even footing. I had sensory processing disorder, um, uh, co comorbid with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and it's, it's a really, 
common comorbidity for people with autism. And so often I will have to play a game either completely soundless or low screen brightness or the F plus because games with bright colors, loud sounds is going to throw me off my game. So having having something like this would let me play it with my eyes shut when I'm overstimulated, so I'm only processing. That, that is a great point. So I'm only processing one kind of sensory with my hypersensitive sense instead of vision and hearing. Do you mind if I use that story going forward? Because yeah. that, that's uh, a segment I hadn't considered. Um, but that's that's great. Like right there, a practical use of this, you're fully sighted, correct? Yes. But this could absolutely help. Um, my older boy also has Asperger spectrum issues, which may be another reason why he likes playing around with the color settings to find one that's soothing to him. Yeah. So touch is an underutilized element. Yeah. So virtual reality or augmented reality, which are like the new wave of video game sensory experiences, are a lot more challenging for blind people to interact with. If you gave them the audio cues, they don't always have the physical cues to move in the direction they need to. Because um, I don't want to speak with this because I don't have an authority on it, but from my experience, it's been that blindness can also cause motor function issues with balance and other things until they become more proficient with it. I can only imagine that trying to interact with VR, processing that motion with everything else you have to process could be overwhelming. To the point where that is an area where I could see that programmers and developers need to understand the technology first before they start adapting it to other needs. Um, because my students, for example, struggle enough just with the basics of virtual reality programming that I need them to do something simple to start with so that they understand it and can implement something more complex. So that you can do it step by step rather than trying to do all 10 steps at once. That, that's my take on it. Anyway. So this is especially true for board games, but more so for video games for people who use a controller. I just bought a Steam box and a Steam controller, and it's got this really, really weird controller setup that feels completely uncomfortable and alien in my hand, but some of my friends love it, because it just fits right and it feels right and it's the right size, so that sensory input and comfort is really, really important. Resistance. You can do a lot of this through the rubble technology and controllers. The further you push a stick, the more intensely it rumbles to give you a sense of resistance or force. Uh, for games, texture is a big deal. If you can't differentiate by color, you can differentiate by texture, symbol, or pattern. So you've got four different ways that you can visually convey information or sensory. Some cards have a special coating on it that gives them little ridges on them, uh, which makes it easier to shuffle and handle, but also provides a better textural feel for people. What's interesting with Braille is this student, Josh, that I was talking to was saying that Braille is a dying language because it's harder and harder to get teachers to teach it because fewer people use it with audiobooks and with the ease of saying, hey Siri, solve my problem. They don't need to learn Braille to function. So he was concerned about, he had taken a lot of time to learn Braille, and he's wondering going forward, what is going to be the tactile replacement for that or will other technology like Siri, which when you initialize it, you can set it up for a blind mode or a colorblind mode, and it will go through and set up all of your customization requirements to best suit your uh, visual needs. Um, I'm like, that's a great question that I had never considered. But a lot of people are Braille illiterate because just like we're used to having things visually given to us, watch the movie instead of reading the book, they can have answers given to them instead of having to read it, which also he said is the reason why I had done a study on this, this was based on his comments and information he was given, that spelling and grammar among the uh, blind community is terrible because they're never required to use it. Without Braille, they don't have to read, so they don't know, they don't need to have to write. Hey Siri, open an email. 
Dragon Dictate, take this down. And everything will do it for them. So here's an interesting controller reconfig that was hacked by somebody to make it easier for them to play. Um, I can't remember exactly, but what I believe is that this player uh, was missing more than one finger on his left hand. And it was difficult for him to control that, but he was super dexterous with his right hand, and it was a lot easier to put more functionality over there. So there are all these other buttons that represent, for example, the left trigger is actually over here on the right D stick. So there are customization options, and hey, if you've got the technical skills, you can do this, or you can find somebody to do it for you, or wouldn't it be great if we made our controllers modular enough where you could reconfigure things. And more and more controllers are coming out that have that level of control. Not to this degree, but at least to some degree. Uh, if you're a, a PC gamer, you can back the whole keyboard. Exactly, so, so the keyboard is a great, for, for games that require that, the keyboard is a really, really good example of being able to use a dominant hand. If you need to. Also, because if I have four buttons on the left and four buttons on the right, I can and I can say, don't have a left hand, I can put all these buttons yep. on the right on my number pad. Oh, exactly. And, or you know, if I want my left hand on the mouse or whatever. Oh yeah, and, and being able to assign more so, functionality to buttons or to sides <coughs> can be so helpful, especially because buttons nowadays are contact sensitive. So the longer you hold it down, you could assign a different value to tapping it versus holding it. Like how high you jump. We already do it with some games. The longer you hold the space bar down, the more you jump. So why not, if I tap B, it's one thing, but if I hold B down, it's something else. So we already have the ability to do it. We just need to tell the program to do it or to make it available. All right, so Sightless Combat is the name of the player. There are a bunch of YouTube videos where you can watch him kick other people's ass. So, planning accessibility, um, the earlier on in the process that you're able to start, the easier it is to implement, and the cheaper it is. So this is called a Gantt chart, and basically what it does is it tracks the different number of people that are involved, and the, it's the logistics of the project. Who's involved, of what time, how much is it gonna cost me, who do I need to assign to this? It's great for project management. The downside is a lot of people don't think about this until the very end because finally an external play tester will bring up, oh wait, this is really, really hard for me to play. Or, like Terminal Rock Studios found out after they launched Evolve, holy crap, we forgot one entire segment of our gaming community. Let's backpedal. <laughs> so they make these changes at the end. The problem with that is everything else that they've been coding has been working toward one particular outcome. So they have so many things that they need to change to get back to that same endpoint. Whereas, oh, and that is hella expensive. You might need to bring in additional people, you might have to delay things. If you just put it at the very beginning of your project, if in your early project meetings, it's like, hey, what about line gamers? Or, you know, this would be really easy. We don't have to, have to keep it tied to this control scheme. Can we offer a colorblind mode and just bring the conversation up earlier in the process? It's easier for, from a purely business standpoint, make smart decisions. Marketing-wise, how will this impact us? Budget-wise, how will this impact us? Do we have the skill and technology to do it? Is it worth our time? Eventually, everything's gonna come down to a money decision for a business, but it allows them to have that conversation earlier and show them that doing it now will save them time and money than doing it later. Uh, and so this is the part, I have my students make a Gantt chart when they're doing their projects because I've got anywhere from six to 10 students who don't know each other working on the same project together, trying to coordinate between art and programming, and they need to be able to communicate and understand who's working on what. And early on during the planning sessions, I'm like, so, this is really, really busy with lots of visual effects. How's a colorblind person gonna be able to, what do you mean? I just held up my phone with that little, and they're like, oh my god, the game looks terrible. 
eventually they changed it to the point where it's still not the same, and it never will be, but it was much easier to see and much easier to appreciate the amount of time and energy they put in. They put in hundreds and hundreds of hours into it, so why not make it as accessible and successful as possible? One of the things I talk about is we're producing portfolio pieces, and we want to make it appealing to as many people as possible, because why limit yourself to only a small segment? It's not that you're necessarily targeting that group of people, but if in the natural course of development, you can already help serve that audience, it is foolish not to, in my opinion. All right, so that's the information that I have and present. Um, thank you for your anecdotes for it, because that's something I hadn't considered specifically. Uh, I know that this doesn't address every single type of disability, because everyone's disability affects them differently. And they game differently, and prefer different types of games. And if you play more than one type of game, you know that what you need to be able to do physically or mentally is very different in a tense first person player versus player shooter than it is playing Bejeweled. Slightly different, right? But understanding that, maybe having a focus group, talking to some of those people, you can find them, like you can find Sightless Combat online, drop them an email or a community like that and ask them. Um, so the jewel, easy to change that color scheme. And that's also why all of those have a different icon on them as well. They're just easier to visually identify, colorblind or not. So, all right, that's the information I have to share and my opinions on it that I pass along to my students. I would love to hear your feedback or questions or some of the challenges that you might have or have run into game. I play Destiny, and you've probably already heard about some of the crazy Love stuff that goes on. I've been on raids with uh, both deaf and people players. And just, I got, I got, I got, put, on, I got put on the side of uh, one of our raids with, uh, I think it was a new guy. So lots of dancing, lots of pointing, lots, lots of- well, it, it's, it's interesting that another thing that you can do is you can map behaviors to your avatar in a lot of games, like a jumping jack or a salute or a hello or a wave and there are all these emotes. That's a whole other visual language that you can use to communicate in game that they can't communicate via keyboard or mute, they can't contribute to a ventriloquism, for example, where they're all talking to each other. Um, so a lot of games already have something like that, you just need to be aware of it. Uh, both the player that they can do that and the players around them that that's how they communicate. And uh, in his case, he could cough. So he'd cough and then he'd emote. Just so that we didn't like lose him and like forgetting to look so, down at the So uh, you needed a cue as well. Yep. <laughs> so that's, no, that's perfect. That's a great example of how, how we just have to interact and overlap. And you have another comment. Oh no, I was pointing at you. Oh, um, so Eurogames. Yep. Eurogames board games, which are made for release in all 18,000 countries in Europe, which all speak different languages yep. because Europe's a mess. We, we call that race to the galaxy. Yeah. But to your point, it's the reason that they do that so much is absolutely right. The language is German. Translating most texts into German makes it about 15% longer. Translating into kanji needs much more specialized translators than others because a lot of the same uh, references, uh, idioms, and things like that don't translate well. But we use what's called black plate replacement. If you can make sure that everything that you would need to change to internationalize it is all on the black of the CMYK when you're printing uh, physical materials, it's a lot easier to exchange. And it's a lot easier to do that with symbols because you know consistently that the symbol will be the same size in a Japanese or a German or a French. Uh, the game Blood Multi Manager that I did was translated into nine different languages. It was amazing to see how different they looked based on the amount of information that they tried to cram into the text box. Yeah, um, 
simple dense data using Please provide representations. I cannot keep it in one fourth grade which one of the three dancing Vikings makes you draw a card. Like Sometimes they try to be overly theme tied rather than being useful. That they go way too much for form and not for function. Excuse me. On this point, like one of the things I, I just like remember. I'm grabbing yeah, a mug like, to do so. Uh, the thing is the, the thing is isn't there and isn't there like a dance between with with certain games between, you know, making something too easy or too complicated where you like in other words, like take a game like Street Fighter Two. That game to you know, to me is like just the pinnacle of having like a deep meta game that people who play you know fighting games can really get into and master. Yeah. But still not making like, you know, I don't know, my cousin who barely plays a game anymore go over and pick Vega and go, All right, I can't I can't <laughs> Spam the X button, do the 100 hand yeah. slap or whatever it is, right? So, okay, that gets into a more complex thing called first order and second order rules and functions and heuristics and all this stuff, which basically means an entry point that is easy for anybody, and then once they've mastered the basics, they can move on. Overwatch does this with a rating system of how difficult or complex this character generally is to play. A lot of um, MMOs also do the same thing because certain classes may have different restrictions. I mean, Role-playing games do a pen and paper ones. If you want to be the simple one, be the fighter. If you want the more complex experience, be the wizard. Right? But a lot of games will try to ease you into a comfort level until you're at the right level for you. Right? Like, I cannot play Hanzu or Genji to save my life. But my 10-year-old can nail somebody across the map when he's hopping around. And I don't know if everyone realizes they're being punked by a 10-year-old. <laughs> when he is Genji, he owns the field. It is disgusting. <laughs> I'm also proud at the same time. So. Um, did you have a comment? Yeah, just with the VR, I've had, when it first came out, like they, they made it like a six-year-old game. Yeah. And I was like, oh, hang gliding. I tried that once, I cannot play it because of my vertigo. That's vertigo another terrible. big I issue with VR. Yeah. And, and even people who normally do not experience motion sickness, because of the detachment of the virtual world from their physical movements, can trigger an incredibly violently sick reaction. Um, we've had some students who were doing VR projects which stopped and went back to a regular project in Unreal or Unity because developing their own game was making them nauseous. <laughs> right, so that's another reason why like, it, it's hard to adapt it until the, the core of the audience is comfortable with and familiar with it. Yeah? What I wonder too is that, what I wonder too is like motion games, like motion games, that like, games like Dance Dance Revolution, I feel like they can't do because all of the technology like, they have to like, just censor the music and censor the like, actual human hand. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, is there, so like, there has to be a way to program, you know, there has to be a way to program something like So like a connect action. could fill in the rest of a, a frame for you? Something like that, or it could recognize that if I do if I do something with my arm, that's the equivalent of somebody doing something with their hand. With their full. Yeah. So that's a really interesting issue that I haven't considered. Um, for people uh, with multiple in us, or or I've had some people like we don't have a hand or an arm, but for something like that and thinking about it with a rhythm game. That is a complex situation that I would love to sit down with a group of my programmers and figure out. Because I bet they could come up with a solution in a week. It might not be perfect, but it would work and allow them to at least have a starting point to get feedback from it. Yeah. Right? Because if you have to already uh, gauge your connect for a relative distance that you are 10 feet from me, then I already know how high you are, how tall you are. I already know the average length of somebody's wingspan for your height. So it should be able to extrapolate the rest, Yes. right? It's just that it's not built to do that yet because nobody thought about it. Exactly, which is why I don't have a Going forward, hopefully more and more often, the, the connect is a blessing and a curse. For some people though, it allows them to uh, interact by giving voice commands. 
Um, so like they can command troops in some games by doing voice commands rather than having to do it uh, via the patrol. But that's really interesting. Do you mind if I take that back to my students and yeah, kind of throw that at them as a brain teaser? Yeah, absolutely. That would be really, really interesting to think on. Thank you. I, I hadn't considered that either. Like I said, I'm kind of straightforward and brash and really ignorant about a lot of them, which is why I, it's important to me. I need to be better first. I think yeah. while we're on the subject of motion controls, like I remember when Mario Galaxy came out and Mario Galaxy 2, and I was so disappointed that I didn't really enjoy it because there, there A, wasn't really an option, as far as I know, there wasn't an option to use a regular GameCube controller like there was in Sonic Colors. Mm, um, okay. It's a business decision that, well, first it's probably an ignorance decision where people just aren't aware of it. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it would be a business decision of how large a market is that yeah. and how much we need to do. But a lot of these things like that ping and chirp system, mm -hmm. there are millions of people that could benefit from that, yeah. not just people who are absolutely blind. There are other people who could benefit from that. Uh, I was in a coma for a month and when I came out, I was paralyzed from the neck down. It took me a long time to gain use of my right arm. It would have been great if I would have had some assistance for something, because going the month or so till I recovered some feeling without gaming, I gave all the time. <laughs> going without gaming that long was very difficult and challenging for me. I, I can only answer or engage with a few more before we have to wrap up and move into the next one. So if I don't get to you, apologize. Happy to talk more out in the hall. But thank you also for taking time in your Sunday to, to stop in. I appreciate that. Uh, actually, your panel was my most anticipated one. Well, thank you. But, um, but, but not, your, did, it, did it work out? Was it okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was my most anticipated <laughs> <laughs> Because I went to a lot of panels, but it was the most anticipated one. Made sure I was here early so I could get in. But I play on MMOs on both the PC and the PS4, mm -hmm. and I cannot platform. I am really slow on the PC, and yep. then you put me on the PS4, and I am as my brother put it, one of the best healers he's ever met in the game. So, so that is a great point because there are some cross-platform games where I suck if I have to use the keyboard. Anything that requires real-time response, do not give me a keyboard. I would prefer a control. Anything where, like, a, a CRPG, a role-playing game where I can map out 20 different spells, oh yeah, I'm all over that. Give me a keyboard. So it's fortunate now that we've got the technology that we've got multiple means of interacting with games. Right? Um, and even handheld games um, on phone apps, right? They've got virtual joysticks instead of needing actual joysticks. There are a lot of different ways to interact with it, but especially titles that are cross-platform, there may be a version of it that you're more comfortable with. So if you're frustrated on the PC version, maybe there's an, an Xbox One or PS4 version of it that would be better suited to how you perform. Yeah, because I can memorize the controls. Yeah. I don't even have to see the hot bar. Right, right, and I'm not good enough to do that super fast in the middle of something. Yeah. I just want to mention, I mean, not that accessibility should focus on um, people who aren't disabled as the only reason to, you know, make changes, but um, I have a lot of times where I'm like, well, I work at a desk job, I get, you know, tendonitis or otherwise get sore in my hands, and so I'm like, I can't sit down and play video games because if I hold a controller like this, for a couple hours, my wrists are gonna flare up. Yep. You know, and that's not like something that's unusual to me. I'm sure there are many people in that situation. So it's like, you know, just make controllers, you so, know, separable, or in but, other words, just like more modular so that you reach more people for a wide variety of reasons. That is an excellent point. I think one of the things that people overlook is that if you spend the time to consider accessibility for a certain group, there will always be another group that will benefit from it as well. If you design a game for role players, there's a good chance that people who you wouldn't consider your primary target could also play, right? If you design it smartly. 
Um, that's unfortunately all the time we do have. We've got to make way for the next group that's coming in here. But I will be out in the hall if anybody would like to follow up or share their comments. Thank you so much for coming out and spending some time with me. I appreciate it.